Excellent. Good evening, everybody, and thank you so much for being here, um, especially to our panelists. And I think a logical question that everybody asks is, we've just got through this wretched thing. Why would anyone want to talk about this? Why would anyone want to listen to this anymore? The reason we put this panel together is that it is really important to remember. We have a human tendency to blot out unpleasant things. And the pandemic has probably been the most unpleasant thing globally that we have experienced since the Second World War. I just look at the figures. Seven million people died, and these are minimum figures, really conservative estimates. Seven million people died globally. At least 500,000 of them were in this country. Around 750 million people got infected, and this is very conservative. It's only people who went and got tested or felt ill who come you know, within this number. 450, around uh, 44 million, right? 4.4 crore people were in India. We've gone through lockdowns, we've suffered the pain of death, we've had people gasping for breath because they didn't have oxygen, we've had shortages of hospital beds. These are things that quite naturally I think we blot out. But these are things that need to be remembered so that the next time around we are better prepared. Because I think if there's one global lesson from the COVID pandemic, is that it, those countries that protected their people best were the countries that had experienced something similar. That was SARS in 2003, which affected a lot of East Asia, China, Hong Kong, Vietnam, Singapore, all of those countries that had experienced SARS knew immediately what to do once this new disease came. Africa, and you can correct me, I'm sure you, you know a lot more than I do. Africa, I think, did surprisingly well because of their experience with Ebola. And so it's really important that we remember important not merely as an acknowledgement of the suffering that people have gone through, but that those lessons are codified. And hopefully the next time around, we will be able to protect people better. Now, to draw out some of these lessons, we have this absolutely star panel. These were all frontline soldiers I know, Rajni, you said you hate the war metaphor, <laughs> but <laughs> these were okay. These were all on the front lines in the struggle. Is that okay? In the okay. <laughs> she was saying earlier, I hate talking, use, mixing disease and war. These are two completely separate things. So I won't use any war metaphors in the struggle against COVID. And the reason we were deeply grateful to all of them. Uh, for being here. I won't go over their CVs. Um, it's in the website, and I think everybody knows everyone. Um, but maybe very briefly, I'll starting from that end. Um, Mr. Randeep is, of course, the Commissioner for Health now, but he was on the hot seat in Bangalore during the first two waves of COVID, helping all of us, all of us who live in the city, to manage with the disease, whether it was vaccines, beds, oxygen, whatever it was, he was the person there. Um, Prashant brings a very interesting perspective to COVID because he was in a community in BR Hills. It was an isolated community, a rural community, and they experienced COVID, well, they experienced the full force of the disease, but their understanding and the way they dealt with it was very different from people like us, right? And when I say people like us, it does not mean that they're any different, but it is situation, who you are, does affect how you experience a disease and how much you suffer. Um, so he brings a really good perspective. Uh, Dr. Saumya Swaminathan, and I will use the cliche, she needs no introduction, but I will do it anyway. I think we're all familiar. We've seen her on the TV screens. We've read her interviews. She was chief scientist 
of WHO. I think she was also Deputy Director General, but that was probably before the pandemic, right? So she was Chief Scientist, and this first time the WHO has had a Chief Scientist. Um, and before that, she was Director General of ICMR, and plus, um, I mean, she, she's got immense, immense experience both in science as well as in public health and in medical science. And Dr. Rajni Bhatt was, I and mean, she's probably the only active clinician. I think there are many on the panel who are doctors, but she was the only practicing clinician, and she's a pulmonologist. And you know what COVID does, it goes straight to the lungs. So she was on the front lines dealing with patients, um, mostly by remote, but we will get her experience as well. So what we've got is four people with very different perspectives of the same event. And what I want to do with your help really is to tease out their experiences and try and capture some of this. And at the end of the day, we're all doing this so that future generations hopefully will be a little bit, bit better protected than we have been. So with this perhaps overly long interview, I'm sorry, introduction, I'm going to uh, proceed with the panel themselves. And this is what we're going to do. There are about three broad sets of questions that they will discuss, um, answer these questions, bring their perspectives on, and then um, I will throw it open to all of you as well. So the first sort of question as it were, is where exactly are we now with COVID, right? Last week, uh, the World Health Organization announced that the um, health emergency, the global health emergency is over, but they still said this is a very dangerous virus. The disease has not gone. So what are we to make of that? Uh, there are many experts who have described COVID as being an endemic disease now. So how are we to respond to that? What exactly does it mean in terms of our relationship with COVID? Many of those who suffered COVID also had, have, ex are experiencing what has now been called long COVID. Symptoms that may come a while after the actual, you know, the initial disease symptoms subside, but they affect different parts of the body um, and they're very unpleasant. So long, for those with long COVID, COVID is definitely still continuing. So where are we right now? What, do, how, what sense are we to make of the situation that we are in now and how best should we protect ourselves? Uh, maybe uh, Dr. Swaminathan. Good evening, uh, everyone. And thanks so much, uh, <clears throat> Thomas, for this uh, panel and, and, and for this question. So as you said, um, the Director General of the, the WHO, Dr. Ted Ross announced about a week ago that the public health emergency of international concern is, is over. Um, a public health emergency of international concern is uh, the highest level of alert that the WHO can put out. It's uh, based on the international health regulations that were last uh, updated in 2005, actually following SARS, because it was found to be very inadequate. Now, of course, again, the world has realized that it's still very inadequate and therefore they're being revised again. So there have been six declarations so far, including Ebola, Zika, polio, the H1N1, and so on. And um, so 30th of January 2020 is when this was declared. Of course, later on in March, uh, it was characterized as a pandemic. And the pandemic is not officially any kind of alert. So it's very confusing to people because a pandemic is what is easily understood by people. We use the word pandemic in the past as well, but there is no such official thing in the, in the WHO rules and regulations. And so a lot of people criticize the WHO saying you, you uh, characterize it as a pandemic very late, you know, what were you doing? But actually the, the public health emergency is what matters. And that's the one that tells countries act now because this is serious. Um, so now we're in a situation where it's no longer an emergency as it was over the last couple of years for obvious reasons that we know much more about it, we have the tools, we know what to do, etc., which was all not true at the beginning, and the fact that a large uh, part of the world is probably either infected or vaccinated or both, and therefore there's a much higher level of immunity than there has been uh, in the past. And, and that, th therefore, gives confidence that people will 
uh, fight the infection and, and not become very ill or, or end up like what we had during the Delta wave, uh, where there were massive, massive waves of people who needed admission and, and then, of course, deaths. Now, what does it mean uh, for us now? You use the word endemic. It means that it's one more infection that infects humans. Uh, we think this came from an animal, by the way, as a zoonotic, but now it's clearly transmitting human to, to human. And, um, and so it's not going to go away. It's very well established. It is still evolving. It's uh, by, in the history of viruses, three years is a very short time for a virus. It's still very young. It can continue. It is evolving. We see that every few months, uh, the sequencing shows that there's a new variant. The latest one was XBB 1.16, which did cause an uptick of cases in India and in other countries. It's the predominant variant now. It's also Omicron. There are about over 300 sub-lineages of Omicron. So it's evolving. And every time it accumulates mutations that make it more transmissible, that's when we see an upsurge. It's able to overcome our immunity and uh, cause infection. Luckily for us, the vaccines uh, induce a strong T cell response or a cell-mediated immune response apart from antibodies. And that's what's you know, still protecting us all from getting ill like we did in 2020 and 21. We don't know how long that lasts. Immunity does wane. I think we have to remember that the virus continuously changes. Secondly, immunity does wane. And, and the older you are, the more ill you are, or immunosuppressed, the immunity tends to wane faster. And the third uh, variable here is human behavior. And certainly, so it's a virus, it's the it's human behavior or the environment, and it's the immunity. So it's the interaction between these three variables that will determine what happens in the future. Uh, nobody can rule out a variant that can also cause more severe disease, though people think it's unlikely, but you could have that. You could have uh, a scenario where in a couple of years our, our immunity wanes enough that we again become quite susceptible to severe disease. And the third is, of course, that our, uh, well, our behavior in the sense we are back to normal now. Uh, you know, we see a few masks everywhere we go, but very few. And people have got back to their, uh, in fact, they're probably compensating for the years of lost travel, and meeting friends and family and partying. So, you know, all that's happening. Uh, and therefore, you can see that not only is it COVID surges that we saw, but in the last few months, we've had lots of other respiratory viral infections, which we didn't see over the last. Globally, influenza was at the lowest it's ever been, right? But in the last six to eight months, we've seen influenza picking up in all countries because masks are off, people are mixing again, and that's how respiratory viruses spread. So it's not yet seasonal. Uh, influenza is very seasonal in the temperate world, not so much for us. COVID is not seasonal anywhere. It's every three, four months we get that surge because of a new variant. That's likely to be the pattern. Uh, but when things can go worse, we don't know. And therefore, this is why the WHO and others keep saying, let's not say, OK, close the books. Everybody forget about COVID. Let's go home. But we need to keep up the surveillance. We need to make sure we're tracking not only the changes in the virus, is it translating into changes in clinical behavior? Or do you start seeing unusual cases suddenly? And uh, or into increase hospitalization. So that correlation is important between the genomic sequence of the virus and the clinical behavior. And we need to be prepared. In, we have the tools now. So the good thing is you have drugs, which we did not have prior to 2022, uh, at least two antivirals, which are uh, fairly good. We, have, uh, we know how to treat people who get sick, what drugs to use and what not to use. Equally important, because in the first few once you remember, like people were throwing like 25 drugs at you know every patient. That's not at all needed. And we also have uh, vaccines. We can take boosters. Uh, whether we will need to adapt the vaccine as we go along is the other question that we have not yet answered. Some companies have, as you know, last year prepared Omicron adapted variant vaccines, especially uh, Pfizer and Moderna with the mRNA vaccines. But even in India. We have a company called Genova in Pune who has used the Omicron strain for their RNA virus and other companies are saying that they can adapt. So there could be a point where the WHO says 
change the virus composition, uh, vaccine composition, like they do for flu. Every six months, the WHO announces which flu uh, strains must be used for this year's vaccine. If that happens to COVID, all manufacturers will then have to gear up to, to, to do that. And, uh, and so that I think that's probably where we are today. And uh, yes, there are uncertainties still, which over the next few years will slowly, I think we'll start seeing uh, a pattern. Thank you. I'm going to come to Hello. Yeah. Thank you very much. So what I'm taking away from that, and obviously we're all living our normal lives, but the fact is this can come back in new forms, um, and we need to be prepared for that. And so I'm going to turn to you, Mr. Randeep. If it does come back in a new form, um, transmits better, maybe even produces more severe illness, what would your response on behalf of the Karnataka government how well prepared are you? What, what, what are the sort of things that you would do? What are the sort of things that you are ready to do? Yeah, so thank you for having me here. And uh, uh, I've had the opportunity, I would say, but not of choice, but having handled all the three waves. And each one was so different from the other. Uh, I really wonder whether we were prepared for any, any one of the three. Uh, the first wave, it hit us. Uh, people said it was a mild flu, then it got a bit more severe, and then it subsided. And uh, never in our wildest imagination would we have expected the second wave to hit us so badly, because that is something which scientists, administrators, general public would have ever thought could hit. And suddenly we were grappling for oxygen beds, um, ICU facilities, which, which probably the past 50 years we had never thought of. And then came the third wave where the numbers shot up uh, to even larger numbers, but all of a sudden we realized we did not require our oxygen infrastructure. Uh, we required a different kind of a response. We had a large number of asymptomatic carriers moving around, and then we had to protect only the comorbid and the senior citizens. So I, I really don't know uh, whether we would be fully prepared uh, for the next one that is going to hit us. If, if pulmonologists are able to, and, and scientists like doctor are able to guide us in terms of what would be the level of preparedness. Would it mean oxygenated beds? Would it mean large scale uh, uh, support? Because I do remember uh, uh, the scramble for uh, a drug called remdesivir, which was administered at that time, which today people tell me uh, we could have done without, right? So we really don't know how many it did help, how many it didn't help. Uh, we had uh, protocols, we were talked, uh, the people were talking about the cytokine storm and then uh, pulmonologists today say it was something to do with clotting. Uh, so somewhere down the line, I think the messaging from the scientists, from the pulmonologists needs to be clear. As administrators, we need to know what is it that we need to be prepared for. Or, or if it's going to be something which is going to be out of the box, then uh, do we need to have a kind of a funding for that. Government of India, of course, has been uh, advising us. We do have our technical committee. We have a uh, technically advisory committee. We have a clinical uh, committee. They've been doing fabulous work. They've been helping us predict. Uh, we have wastewater uh, analysis along with genome sequencing. Yes, these are predictive. They say that something is happening. But what should my response be? Uh, what should my response be one month down the line? two months down the line, three months down the line. We've been seeing waves, we've been seeing wavelets. Uh, I, I really don't know whether we need to have differentiated responses for all of this. What does an XBB 1.16 mean to me? What does an XBB 1.5 mean to me? These are better known to scientists, but as an administrator, as, as, as uh, a public official, uh, if, if that could translate into doables in terms of what we need to put in place, uh, it, it would be much better. So we have better systems today, not, not to say that uh, our predictive analysis is much better. We have not stopped the bulletin from day one. Uh, uh, we report cases, Karnataka is probably one of the most transparent reporting that we've seen in the country is happened from Karnataka. Even every evening I sign off on that report uh, before leaving office where we 
tell the public how many got infected today, how many in the hospital as on date, how many unfortunate deaths, and, and let's remind ourselves that, that deaths are still happening. Uh, we may, it may still be in single digits, but never has a month gone by when we have not seen a COVID death still. Uh, with the best of, with adequate number of beds available, with treatment protocols being in place, we still have senior citizens here and there, babies do die. Uh, you find perfectly okay uh, guys ending up with severe illness. What does immunity have to do with this? Uh, I think there is a larger question to be answered. Are some people better immune? Will, will pull through? Uh, some people are bound to end up with serious illness. What is the vaccine efficacy? The very big question that as administrators we get faced with, uh, with the huge debate. I could see the uh, vaccine uptake kind of drop immediately after the uh, third wave when people felt that this, this illness was not that severe. So what is the public messaging at those times? How do we kind of push that through? Government of India has now stopped uh, giving us vaccines. Earlier, uh, the policy has changed now. So state government itself is going into the market and procuring it. So these are large questions. I think uh, there are more questions than answers. But if you tell me in the conventional terms whether beds are ready, whether I have a, 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 a software system in place to allot beds, to, to put uh, adequate infrastructure, oxygen infrastructure, then I've done well. Mm -hmm. I have my LMO tanks today. I have uh, oxygen concentrators. Um, I have PSA plants. We have wonderful donors coming in supporting us. And all these systems are in place. But is that enough? That is a larger question for, I think, both the doctors on the panel to tell us. And uh, probably the public, if, if they have any inputs to share with us. Thank you very much. And uh, I think one message, strong message that I'm taking away from what you said is that science, which itself is because the during a fast-moving pandemic, science is also trying to catch up. But that science also needs to be really rapidly translated and communicated, I think, to, uh, to people like yourselves. And I think this is something that uh, Dr. Samya was also doing. Now you, so I'm going to turn to a clinician now, because one of the things you said is pulmonologists need to tell us what we should do. So I'm going to turn to you. And um, in this current phase, are you seeing patients at all with, with COVID symptoms? What, what, what is the kind of advice that you give? What is the kind of advice that you would give to, you know, uh, to those who have to manage, you know, at the public level? So over to you. Well, clinically, we're still seeing patients who are coming in with COVID. And, you know, when, when you see that constellation of symptoms of fever and respiratory symptoms, I still think of COVID. But as Dr. Samya mentioned, we're also seeing a lot of influenza and adenovirus infections. What this has done is it's raised awareness overall about the number of respiratory viruses that we're all susceptible to. Um, I think with the large-scale efforts for vaccine uptake that's happened, it's helped me with uptake of influenza vaccines as well. So earlier, the idea of adults needing vaccines was alien to the Indian population. Um, now it's far more acceptable because they understand, uh, I think, you know, while there's a lot to be done in terms of healthcare messaging, one part of it has gone through is that vaccines will not necessarily prevent disease, but they will help reduce the severity of illness and maybe prevent a hospitalization or an intensive care admission. So that message has percolated even for acceptance of an influenza virus. So we're still seeing patients, um, as has been mentioned before, um, you brought up, Randeep, sir, that you know, we're still having deaths due to COVID. We still have patients in wards, in ICUs, but the numbers are really small. One of the sad things that I've noticed, though, is that the number of hospitals accepting COVID admissions has gone down. Now, considering that we all know now how to manage a disease. It should become possible for every hospital because we've all experienced how to take care of COVID now. And some of our patients who get admitted to our hospital, because our hospital still admits patients with COVID, including patients in the ICU, patients who are immunocompromised, awaiting transplant, that kind of severity of illness, 
they tell us sometimes about stigma that they still face or the feeling that, oh, I'm experiencing human touch and it matters. This was one of the big takeaways, I think, from the COVID-19 pandemic that in the initial phase, there was a lot of fear and stigma. We'd hoped that that would have gone away unless we keep in touch with the fact that this is a disease that's here to stay and that patients who are getting admitted with COVID still need all the medical attention with compassion and empathy. That part, I think, um, we need to make sure that stigma remains uh, addressed in these things. Long COVID is a huge problem. I think we haven't even started to measure it. Um, the good thing is that there are clear definitions that are available now in living guidelines with the WHO, for example, uh, the NICE guidelines in the UK. We have all of these which help us to define it. Are we doing enough to capture it? Maybe not enough. There are certain screening questionnaires that are available. I think um, the UK uses a Newcastle screening. We've done some studies on this and it's very variable because in some countries they report as much as 15% in others as much as 45% of people who live with symptoms beyond six months. There's a wonderful um, uh, scientist who I used to follow on social media who goes by the name of Physics Girl. It's one year of not being able to be that amazing scientist bringing science to children. This is how it impacts lives. We, I know of colleagues who have had mild illness. So the impact in terms of health is something we'll probably know only in the next five to 10 years. And I'm talking here only about COVID infection. The impact of COVID along with comorbidities, that is something that we'll probably know in the years to come. The impact of COVID in terms of what it has affected uh, for medical education. You look at medical students in medical school or in postgraduate courses who've spent two or three years of their life only dealing with COVID and they are now graduating as subspecialists of another specialty altogether. This has impacted a a, an entire generation. Uh, the part that we're living with is the immediate, and I hope, um, as Dr. Saumya mentioned about human behavior, the one thing that I hope we learn to continue to follow is that if one is sick, don't go to work. Don't send your child to school when they're sick. These were things that we started following. It would apply to all respiratory illnesses and it would do a world of good. As you mentioned, countries which had faced um, mass infections and epidemics before did much better. So I hope we carry those lessons with us. Thank you. A couple of really, um, I think, salient points I'm taking out from what you said. One, of course, is the fact that whatever we may say about a public health emergency or not, COVID is still with us not just in terms of the virus circulating, but in its long-term impact, and that is still being played out. So in, in fact, this seems to be a continuing um, um, issue, and clearly some sort of communication, I think, is required either from the government or from other agencies, saying that this is actually continuing without scaring people, um, but also acknowledging the fact that a lot of people are still suffering from this, and we don't still don't know um, the effect of that. And the uh, other point that I'm taking away is the fact that hospitals are fine, uh, reluctant to admit uh, COVID patients and, uh, you know, and are turning them away, which I think is another issue that probably will need, you know, to be addressed over time. So with that, um, Prashant, if I can turn to you, um, from where you are, and I'm, I'm, not, I'm not calling you here. I mean, it makes it sound as though you're some representative of, <laughs> of the people. <laughs> I'm talking to you as a public health person, the doctor who happens to be placed there. How are the people in the community that you live in experiencing this? For them, would it make any sense to hear any of these things, that the public health emergency is over, long COVID <laughs> is still an issue? Does it make any sense to people there? And if not, how, what makes sense to them about COVID right now? Sure. Thanks. Um, I wanted to share that I'm also a clinician. <laughs> okay, I'm sure. But I'm only a half day a week clinician. Um, <clears throat> so coming from Chamrajnagar, Chamrajnagar district, um, in a public health research field station in BR Hills, Biligiri Um where uh, the district also, uh, like uh, uh, the commissioner was saying, um, faced a terrible second wave. So there was a huge amounts of learning from the whole pandemic that we can 
I wish we could write about. That's not, there are books that are not written about that. But uh, I just want, I mean, I'm, I'm listening to this discussion, which is very important uh, about the variants, about uh, the oxygen and healthcare infrastructure that was built, about the still continuing pandemic. And I'm just trying to locate, imagine that you are, you are in a small village, you are within a tiger reserve, um, for the sake of, uh, you know, just to give you a thought experiment, the village that you can have in mind has a name called Purani. Purani is a small village in Biligarangan Betta Tiger Reserve. Uh, there are about 60 households there. They are about uh, 100 kilometers away from a district hospital and they are about 220 kilometers away from Bangalore, from a super specialty hospital. Um, you belong to a community which is one of Karnataka's 12 Aranya Adharita Budakattu, uh, forest associated Adivasi communities. The community I'm talking about is the Soliga. There are about uh, 40 to 45,000 people in Chamrajnagar of this tribe. Um, and you don't have telephone connection, you don't have uh, connectivity, um, there is no tower. Uh, the road does not reach you because tiger is our national animal, conservation is a priority. These are very difficult questions. Should a road go to Purani becomes a matter of protecting tigers, but it's also a matter of uh, protecting livelihoods and securing, um, uh, you know, preventing maternal deaths, uh, you know, all of that. So you are in this reality where, you know, there's no road, there's no water connection, there's no telephone and then COVID uh, hits. It's really something from another world. It, it, I feel like many people there felt that this is not my disease. It doesn't bother me. And in fact, during the first wave, it did not bother. Chamrajnagar, in fact, was a, what they called a green uh, district. No, evergreen, they said Chamrajnagar, because they reported very less number of cases. Probably were not testing uh, extensively, but we reported uh, less cases. Uh, and then, uh, when one of your own kind, one of your own people uh, has a sudden death, and then people show up saying, we have come to save your lives and we bring a vaccine. This one is going to save your life. People are completely perplexed. You know, my life could have been saved by a road, it could have been saved by water connection, it could have been saved by so many other things. And now you guys are telling me this vaccine will save my life. It was very difficult to really even have this conversation. And this is not a conversation, frankly, that I had. So thankfully, we had a folk theater group. Um, I, and I wish they could perform here today. Because if you ask me, what is the one thing that remains from COVID in BR Hills? It is a song called Corona Mari. Mari, after all, as many in many Indian languages, is how we remember infectious diseases, right? Mari is the, the, pox, the chicken pox, it's measles. These are all different kind of maris. And in, in folk tradition there, Corona Mari is how it will be remembered. And there's a folk theatre artist called Basavaraju. He's from uh, another village. He's a Soliga artist from Erekan Gadde. He wrote this beautiful song called Corona Mari. And in that song, he really communicates some of these uh, signs, you know, how Corona Mari in one small village far away where we do not know. It was a new disease. It jumped and it went from that country to another. And it is now in our doorsteps. And how we have to become more aware. And the vaccine is our right. So just like forest is our right, now vaccine is our new right. We should not be deprived of these rights. So he totally reframed the dialogue from being afraid and distancing yourself and you know not engaging to saying that this is a right. We have to engage with this. Why I bring it up is exactly what you said in the beginning. Who we are actually determined how we uh, affect, we, we responded, how we received this pandemic. And for very many different communities in Karnataka, this has meant very different things. Um, and, and at least from what I could gather from many of uh, the Soliga collaborators we work with, is that for them, COVID was difficult, not because of the complexities of the virus, but because um, the relationship with health services was not already well established and built. So the fact that you now have to go and stay in a quarantine center uh, far away from your forest meant that I don't want to get tested. I don't want to know if I have COVID. I'll figure it out. If it uh, kills me, I don't know. Other things have killed other people in my, my place. I don't want to get tested. So in some sense, prior relationships established how people responded there to the pandemic. And for me, I think, if you ask what are the lessons from this pandemic, it's much beyond COVID. I would say the lessons is how do we really build caring health systems, where which caring and trustful health systems, 
for everyone. Um, of course, mistrust in health systems is not only a tribal problem. There are so many highly educated uh, PhD holders in other disciplines who were uh, also, you know, saying no to vaccine, and they had their own various, uh, uh, you know, uh, reasonings for it. So, I think for me, the lesson from COVID is how do we really rebuild trustful health systems, caring health systems, and health systems that are capable of responding uh, not only to COVID to any uh, severe, chronic, or acute crises that we may see in the coming days. Thank you. I, th I think you've, um, you've really pointed, and this is the huge issue, I think, that is going to confront people. Um, and that's the hardest thing to do, how to build a caring and responsive uh, health system. And clearly, we're not going to come to any solutions right now. But I think this, this, this really is the uh, million dollar question. And if I may, if we can just spend one minute, not oh, each perhaps, on any ideas that we might have on how do we best reform? How do we build on the understanding that we all have on improving? Or is there one thing that we can do to make the health system more responsive, more caring, more, more able really to give people the kind of, and give marginalized people, people who don't have access to super specialty hospitals, um, the kind of care the health care that they um, require, especially during a pandemic, but also during all the other diseases that have never gone away, uh, you know, and or which are coming back now. And they may have been hidden during um, influenza is, is classic. So if, if, if I could uh, just spend a little time on um, gathering some of your thoughts on this. I wasn't originally planning to ask this question, but I think it's a logical direction that this, uh, um, you know, this discussion is taking. So, uh, Dr. Swaminan, can I, can I sort of start with you, since uh, you've been working in this area for a long time? Yeah, I mean, I think this is really important and it's, it's tough to do. What I think is that, uh, you know, we have to look at the last mile and, and what is happening there, as, as uh, Prashant says, and it's going to be ex very different uh, the context in an urban, low-income setting, let's say, you know, a slum or something like that, than what it is in a rural or a tribal hamlet. And therefore, applying the same standards and the same rules and the same program and not having the flexibility is not going to be the, the right approach. So I think really there has to be much more decentralization of the delivery. Uh, yes, you know, fundings come, the standards come, the protocols come, but um, what exactly is needed in a health and wellness center in a tribal area compared to what may be needed in an urban area? For example, I saw in one uh, place I visited, the health and wellness center had an exercise room next to the... So I said, what is this? So she said that there's a, already an exercise bike there, that, that a treadmill was expected and that there was also going to be yoga on the first floor. So this is, a, again, a tribal district, not in Karnataka, but where people are so thin, they are walking already, you know, miles and miles and working physically the whole day labor they're doing. And in fact, the Ashas and Anganwadis were saying, please, can't we have cycles, you know, to ease our work? But in that place, to put a treadmill and then, you know, to expect somebody to come, I thought that was, like, so ironical. So, and then when I asked the local doctors why, they said, well, this is all planned, you know, centrally. We don't have a say in this. So it's, it's a, an example, a rather funny one, but it's a waste of resources. Obviously, treadmills cost a lot of money. Um, so I think that decentralization, involvement of the community, and I think that that's what primary health care, that one element that's missing, I think, in most countries, and the one country that I've seen which does it really well is Thailand. Uh, they really have a good primary health care going down to the uh, community level. Um, but the, the, the local community is involved, and I don't think our Panchayati Raj institutions are at all involved in anything to do with health. So I think it's time that people think of health. I think now people have realized health, but then what concretely would they like? And they have to start demanding. 
And one of the things that we always say is that unless health is on the political agenda, nothing is going to change. But to get on the political agenda of par parties, people have to demand services. It seems to be that, I mean, it, this is once more goes back to the collective amnesia. It, COVID came, it went, and nobody could do very much about it, but that's okay. Our lives have to go on. And I guess that also has to change to see these as preventable uh, things, not as sort of, you know, blind uh, forces of nature that we can do nothing about. I think that it's really important. Mr. Randeep, as a, an administrator now, um, and though, I mean, Bangalore obviously is, is, is highly urbanized, but you also have very, very, I mean, it's a very heterogeneous population, both in terms of where people come from, the languages spoken, and of course, there are huge disparities in income level. And I wonder if you get some of your experience, because it, once more, it was the marginalized and the poorer who, 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 who suffered the brunt of COVID. And, do you think in terms of administering the city's health programs, the district rather, um, any changes can happen or will happen or what should happen to, to, to protect uh, people better, especially the marginalized people better? Uh, no, I think Dr. Samya uh, has hit upon the right point. This uh, one size fit all model it will definitely not work. Where Dr. Prashant comes from is totally different from BBMP where I served. And uh, believe me, even in BBMP, if, if pre-COVID you would ask somebody, like we are in Domlur, if you would ask somebody where the Domlur PHC was, they wouldn't have known. Uh, but post-COVID, believe me, everybody knew where a BBMP PHC was because that, that, that's how it works. You provide adequate service, you provide something that people want, they're going to walk up to you first on priority basis. So Karnataka has tried various models. It's uh, it's not only a brick and mortar kind of a hospital structure that we can depend on always. And even if we do, what about the HR? Places like where Dr. Prashad comes from, you have doctors refusing to go and work. I mean, these are, and, and for obvious reasons, I mean, these are places where you have to be away from family, you need to be really dedicated uh, to work. So we've tried out the Arogya Bandhu model there, where, where we call NGOs, we give our infrastructure and say, please run it please run it for us, we'll pay you. So that's had limited success, uh, even in North Karnataka, in accessible areas, Uttar Kannada, places like Chamrajnagar. Uh, we, we've had mixed kind of a response there, but, but it, it is an approach which is slightly different from what we otherwise do. Uh, we also have the modic, uh, mobile medical units where in accessible areas we can't reach up to that. In fact, we have areas where, where ambulances don't reach. So uh, there, there are situations where people will have to carry them on a stretcher for even up to a kilometer and then... Uh, so we really need to think through that how do we do that last mile uh, coverage. We have the hospital on wheels concept. We do a lot of camps uh, clearly with referral pathways where we escalate the cases. Uh, but these are all attempts which, uh, which, 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 we, which we are trying so that the reach of health uh, is, is right up to the last mile. Uh, how far we have succeeded, I think it's for uh, us to introspect and uh, find out which is the best model that suits. But the one good thing is with Government of India's uh, policies of health and wellness centers, at least it has made us think that we really need to reach up to the last mile, which is the sub-center. And uh, we have our, an extensive army of um, the uh, a &Ms, uh, and the ASHAs, uh, it is how best we use them uh, to, to, to ensure that uh, the last mile coverage is done. Uh, but still lots more to be done and uh, we are studying models in Kerala which have succeeded like ma'am mentioned in Thailand. We, we would like to understand that what they do better. And uh, good thing about Karnataka and health itself is a state subject but since a lot of funding comes from the center it, it, it automatically tends to become a concurrent subject. So while the funding is there uh, along with it, there are a lot of watertight conditions, uh, which, which as um, Doctor was mentioning, may not be suitable for that particular. So we need to find and maneuver, uh, along with some state funding, uh, those regional variations that we need to bring. What may work in Chamrajnagar may not work in a Mysore or, or, or in a highly urbanized place. Uh, 
uh, but we are open to experimenting and uh, anywhere and everywhere uh, alternatives have come. We have had MOUs with various NGOs to ensure that health is uh, delivered in an appropriate manner. Dr. Rajni, can I, um, can I, can I turn to you now? Um, so you, as I understand, you have been working in the private sector largely. Is, is that right, in terms of... Uh, well, my work in ho hospital-based hospital medicine work. has been in the yeah. private sector, but I've also worked in uh, the non-profit space in, as, as a part of a collective. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so I'm part of an organization called the Community Science Alliance, which is part of Social Alpha's health and wellness vertical. And uh, in that work, there's a lot of collaborative work with non-profits, which have been doing deep work in rural, tribal, underserved areas. Um, so there is that experience that comes from our partners' work in public health as well, yes. So, so what are your thoughts? And the reason I asked you this is in terms of some of the issues we've been talking about, more caring, more compassionate, and, and you actually had mentioned in your first answer to your first question that in terms of care and the quality of care. So which is also part of a health system. So what do you think can be done really to build up these aspects? Not so much the latest technology, getting the best medicine, or even the latest vaccines, but in terms of the quality of care. Because that is, seems to be as important in saving lives as the best technology, right? Absolutely. I think, you know, there's a combination of things that are coming through, a thread that's coming through, which is, you know, Dr. Swaminathan mentioned about how primary care is what needs to be strengthened. And Randeep sir spoke about, you know, going down from the health and wellness center to the sub-center. And you spoke of the ANMs and the ASHA workers. Now, if I think of that's the last mile, that's the community connect, that is the person I know in my village who I trust when she comes and tells me that this is good for me. Now, it seems like our entire country's national programs, all of it, it's like, you know, it's like the load of Atlas for an ASHA worker to carry, whether it's the tuberculosis program, things about maternal and child health, non-communicable diseases, cancer screening, everything is dependent on this one wonderful ASHA worker. When I think about how would we work, the care part comes from the fact that the ASHA worker is part of the community. So, uh, and when we speak about models like Kerala or Thailand, that's been the biggest strength, that there is a large community connect that's there. It's driven by community health volunteers and this local knowledge and trust that builds up. One of the things that when we were looking at how do you respond to this huge health crisis that we were all, this was the crisis of a lifetime. No one had lived through anything like it or dreamt of it. It was one paragraph in your textbook, maybe, if at all. Um, is just looking at it from that very simple framework of staff and stuff and space and systems and the support that's needed for it. Uh, we know that as a country, we do not have enough doctors for the population that we have. That's something that the government is working on with medical seats, whether it's with, also with nursing and allied health care professionals. There's also, you mentioned the part about, it's not necessary to have the latest technology or the best med maybe that's not the answer to everything. I completely agree with you. There was this big buzz in the media about hosp ICU beds and oxygen. An ICU bed or a ventilator is not useful unless you have a trained ICU nurse and a respiratory therapist and a trained medical professional who knows how to use that equipment. So there's a large component over here which is about making sure that each place has the appropriate equipment in terms of the infrastructure, has the right staffing for it, and the staffing has the support. An ASHA worker has to have the decision-making support. A community health officer or an ANM who is handling all of these problems, some of it which are above their level of training, this is where you use technology, and that's sort of what we hope to do with our work with Community Science Alliance, that you're looking at how do you contextualize what is conceived in a tertiary care center like Ames or one of any of the best tertiary care, quaternary care centers in the world. But how do you apply that in Chamraj Nagar in a tiger reserve and be able to help that ASHA worker, that medical officer in that place to be able to do the best for 
any of these diseases, whether it's a non-communicable disease, whether it's a simple child with diarrhea, whether it's some kind of trauma, or it's, an, it's the next uh, big epidemic that could come through. I think unless we strengthen for rural primary medicine, unless we try and build that up, we will, we will not be able to, so it needs a graded response, most definitely. Um, but this is an area which needs to be developed. I know that there are countries which have wilderness medicine and outback medicine. Maybe that's what we need. We need family medicine is being developed now in India as a very essential specialty. We need a, set, a different branch of family medicine, which will be rural medicine fellowships, and make that attractive to medical students to pursue as a career. You spoke about how difficult it is to have doctors come to rural areas. Countries which have done it well have incentivized rural service mm -hmm. in some shape or form, whether it's financial or academic credits. Uh, so far, it has, in my, in my training years, it, used, it was considered the one year you had to get through. It should not be punitive. Mm -hmm. It should be a period of growth, mm -hmm. which is what we hope to do mm -hmm. with our work, that you make that a period of growth for that young medical professional. So those are my thoughts about continuing with care as well as delivering quality. I think the key challenge really is, is how does one make all this happen? And this is a qu actually this is something, we'll come back to this a little later, and, but I'd like all of you also to think about this. The one thing that's been very clear is that these are not very high on the list of political demands, right? We've just gone through an election in Karnataka. I don't think anyone ever raised the, any of the issues that we are talking about now, right? And this is just barely a year, you know, a year, year and a half beyond this terrible. We, so I think one question really is um, to the panel, but I think every, I mean, you, you've got, a, there's a lot of collective wisdom here as well. How do we make these polit part of the political process? along with providing jobs, along with all of these other things, but clearly this is the only way the change is, 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 is going to, to, uh, to happen. And I'd like to, do you have any questions? So Randi, I don't think I should ask you this question, no? <laughs> but you're welcome to answer no, it. I, I, no, no. Would, uh, I, I would just quickly intervene and say that uh, thanks to COVID in a way, health has regained its prominence. And uh, if you look at the health spending, it's tremendously improved in the last two years. Uh, we are nowhere near the 8% that Niti Aayog has been uh, stressing upon, but uh, Karnataka itself has seen a 0.5% kind of a jump. And this has gone into infrastructure. This has gone into healthcare infrastructure. I shouldn't be lying that uh, the last uh, couple of years have seen a mushrooming of large-scale infrastructure which has come up in terms of buildings, in terms of uh, uh, medical equipment. And uh, the rural service, which uh, Doctor was mentioning, uh, the compulsory government service, is we find young students today uh, spending their first year out of uh, graduation and even PG, going to the remotest parts of Karnataka and working there and giving their services. So I think change has happened. Uh, probably why it was not prioritized uh, uh, during the election process was because people have that wariness about COVID and they don't want to talk about it too much. People don't want to get tested. Uh, there, there is that sense of that this is something which is past, past us. But I think commitments on the budgets have been there and uh, the focus on health uh, would remain. I, I, I don't think we may really go back uh, anymore from where we have actually invested right now. It's very hard thing to hear. Yeah, I, please, just want, I, I had two reflections uh, listening uh, to this. Uh, again, systemic. Because I think one way to look at COVID is to say, Okay, what did a viral disease that had pandemic potential do to humanity? Another is to say, what did a global humanitarian crisis do to us? So both will give different answers. And if you take the second framing, which is a more systemic uh, framing, there are still so many interesting lessons I think we, we still haven't uh, really practiced. For example, uh, look at the openness of the state to spontaneously emerging communitarian effort. It was, it was fantastic, you know, I mean, there were, there were uh, Zoom calls on which uh, lay citizen groups were sitting and discussing with uh, one or the other senior bureaucrats. There was idea exchange happening. So access, doors that never before opened easily were just 
<laughs> completely open. So that is still possible. But um, and 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 I think we should strike while the iron is hot. We should we should also leverage. Uh, I think communitarian um, involvement, not not specifically only through structured schemes that government has. Of course, government has specific schemes in which NGOs can apply and get. Those are more opportunistic kind of uh, things. But general openness, how do we create much more coalitions and partnerships between uh, uh, ward level committees and uh, governments, for example. So this can happen anywhere. This need not happen only in a tiger reserve. It's happened in BBMP. It's happened in so many rural uh, places. And the second one is a big question that comes is whose responsibility really is health and healthcare? And I think that's a very fundamental question. We can uh, go at it uh, from uh, political, social, or medical kind of uh, approaches. And I think what COVID taught us is that it's a, it's a layered responsibility. And somehow, we feel that we need only change from uh, governments. We, we, where is really the private sector, for example? Um, during COVID, we learned that we can do an ICU management for Bangalore, right? A centralized ICU was there. People were calling and saying, okay, there is a bed empty there. Why did we lose that? You know, I mean, still, I think Bangalore needs uh, an ICU, shared ICU system. And I think it's not entirely government's responsibility. Where is really medical associations, uh, docked so many corporate hospitals, why they can still all get together and say, we'll have an online dashboard. We're not going to wait for government to step in and make a dashboard. Here is a dashboard. Eight big corporate hospitals in Bangalore put up our ICU availability. People can quickly check and they can go. So I feel we need to really enlarge the dialogue Certainly, the state has a very big role, but medical professionals, nursing professionals, ward level groups, many of us should still, I think, participate in this uh, dialogue. I think it's, it's very true. Um, and obviously, the next question is who is going to really do this? And I'm not sure where, you know, how do. And this is, I mean, everything that you've been saying has been fascinating, but at the end of the day, who's actually going to do this? Is there some, is there, can we use COVID? Is it a moment where we actually start doing some, you've mentioned some things that are actually happening in terms of, a, a, you know, changes in the way health is managed. The budgets are pretty good right now. But is there a way really to push this? And, and the reason once more is to protect us from future waves and so on. So I'd like to uh, throw that to you, uh, Dr. Sam. One thing I haven't mentioned, you, you are also uh, chairman of the uh, MSS Research Foundation, which is involved in a wide variety of, of, uh, of activities, not just in agriculture, but really in, in, in rural life. So I'm, I'm, I'm throwing this question to you with that hat on, <laughs> you know, for you wearing that hat as well. So how do we push this? I mean, that really is. Yeah, so I think a couple of things. And mm -hmm. one is, as uh, Prashant was saying, this um, health uh, is, is uh, determined by so many factors. I mean, this, uh, the determinants of health, as we all know, are not just the number of hospitals and health centers that you have. So what the health ministry um, needs to do is to really become a steward for health not just delivering on the health programs through their own budget, you know, on the line items, um, but really saying, okay, in um, my state today, my major burden of disease is non-communicable diseases. I'm having so many uh, people, uh, premature mortality, that's people who die before the age of 70 of, let's say, a cardiovascular event or stroke, uh, that my premature mortality is this much. It's mainly due to underlying risk factors of hypertension or diabetes or, or growing obesity. And if I don't tackle these, then no amount of hospital beds and ICU beds is ever going to, or dialysis mm -hmm. beds. So you're going to run out of cash. I mean, your, your, your budget got, went up in the last two years. Let's see if it continues to go up at the same rate. It will be fantastic if it did. Um, but the problem is that if you don't turn the tap off, then you're, you're going to have an increasing, we are all going to live longer, there's no doubt about mm. that. But we need to live healthier longer, not unhealthy long lives. And uh, unfortunately, today, if you look at the data, the last 10 years of life, let's say our uh, expectancy, life expectancy is about 70 now in India, but the last 10 years are lived with lots of chronic illnesses and morbidities and lots of expenditure to the health system. So what does it mean? Air pollution needs to be tackled. 
Can the health ministry do it alone? No, it can't, because it's, it has to have multi-sectoral action. Um, the commercial determinants of health need to be tackled. Uh, the unhealthy diets that we're eating, the lack of physical exercise, and of course, tobacco and alcohol. So these are the top five risk factors mm. for chronic disease, which is what is going to, South India has already completed the demographic epidemiological transition long time ago. The North is still facing you know, high maternal and child mortality, infectious diseases, but not in the South anymore. We're going to have more cases of uh, dementia you know, as, as we live longer. Mm -hmm. How are we going to take care of our aging mm -hmm. populations? I think these are the things we need to think mm -hmm. about. And all of these learnings during COVID, I think, will help. Because a lot of technology was used. We shouldn't switch it all off. And uh, you know, like telemedicine, we're, it'll be an excellent thing for, like you were saying, for the elderly, for people who live far away, you can't keep coming back. There's no need to. But you still need to keep in touch with your provider. Uh, of course, whether everybody has access to digital, that's another thing. So you have places where there is no network coverage, et cetera. So we can't apply it everywhere. But I really think that health ministry needs to say now, OK, I'm the steward of people's health, not just delivering health care. Mm. So I remember once tweeting saying it should be the disease of uh, well-being, not the disease of illness or, you know, or the ministry of disease. It should be the ministry of well-being, which means you've got to convene the other departments and say air pollution is a, is a huge problem. The models show that it accounts for so many premature deaths. It, it is uh, something we can do something about. How do we get everyone together, scientists, citizens, et cetera, and say, and the private sector will obviously play a big role. Food companies, you know, how, can you, how do you transition to selling a little healthier food? These five rupee packets of kurkure that the poor mm. children are eating today, mm. you know, is really, doing them a lot of harm, mm -hmm. much more. There is things like lead. I recently looked at the data on lead. It's quite frightening, the amount of lead in our environment that our children are exposed to, the kind of cognitive impact it's having. You know, but are we even aware of the lead levels of our population? So much better data collection, surveillance. Surveillance doesn't only mean infectious diseases. Mm -hmm. It means the surveying the health risks and identifying those uh, which are high priority and then taking action on them. And mostly the action is, if you look at lead, for example, it's, it's in uh, adulteration in food, it's there in, of course, our toys and uh, it's still in our paints and things like that. And, and of course, in the disposal of batteries and, you know, a lot of the poor are involved in that type of uh, activity. They get exposed mm. the most. So I think um, one last point and that is equity. You mentioned the... Uh, huge differences in, um, in income in a city like Bangalore, but if you take overall India, there's, it's huge as well. And therefore, I think for health in particular, when there is any planning done, I think we have to start with equity. And our, is this new service that I'm rolling out, is it, is it providing service to the people you know, at the bottom of the, of the pyramid? They are the ones who need it most. The ones who are there can take private insurance and they don't need any more uh, Common things, yes, like the air we breathe is common. Mm. So that will benefit everybody. Mm. But I think for targeted services, we've got to look at first bringing up the health parameters of the tribals there, you know, are way, way below what the health indicators are of the top quintiles. And so we have to pay attention to that, I think. For any state to be progressive, I think we have to do that. We cannot have huge inequalities in health outcomes. Mm. Dr. Rajni, you would like to... Um what are your thoughts on this in terms of reducing in inequalities, but also creating some sort of movement or in terms of pressure, in terms of making sure that uh, you know, we build better systems? It's such a, you know, as you mentioned earlier, in terms of human behavior, health and health seeking is, uh, is one of those, you know, just like people want to forget COVID, most people don't even want to address the fact that they may fall ill or mortality as a reality is not something most people want to face. Um, so planning for that as behavior change becomes a very, very difficult thing in terms of maintenance of health. Um, you know, we define health as not just the absence of disease, but actually being in a state of positive health. That's not something that people are willing to invest in. Even those who have the means and money, 
even people with good health insurance, it's hard for me to convince them to do an annual health check. <laughs> um, some of the changes that have happened is that there is now a growing awareness with COVID. Maybe one can capitalize on that, but that's not going to translate to a change in behavior in rural and tribal communities where the more pressing needs are road, water. So really, in many such, in many organizations across, or many nonprofits which have led movements, the road to health has been through water, through sanitation, through nutrition, through livelihood. Um, so clean air, nutrition, water, electricity, livelihood, then you start thinking, you know, that's when they start thinking about anything proactively about health. Otherwise, it's just moving from one emergency to another. So I think this is really, as, as Dr. Swaminathan mentioned, about stewardship of health, which has with multiple, multiple dimensions to it. Um, I don't think, I mean, as clinicians, what we can do is encourage it. I think in terms of public messaging, there's a lot of work that can be done. I think the, the next generation of schools and teachers, this is, I find that children are far more willing to accept these messages than adults are. They are far more quick to take up the science of climate change or you know, healthy practices. It's the adults who are not willing to give up their comforts. So I have all my hope in the next generation, honestly, um, in terms of a healthier future, that they will be the ones who will take up this challenge far more easily. Hopefully, they will also stop having kurkure. <laughs> we can achieve that. We get it somewhere. Thank you so much. You know, this has opened up so. We started with talking about a virus, and now we've built. You know, we, we've really got down. I don't know whether we've gone up, but we've really gone down to the base. Because unless these basic issues are addressed, and that is not just due to infectious diseases, but everything else, chronic conditions, and so on, we are really not going to, um, you know, make marginal progress. Yes, because clearly COVID did open up a lot of space for doing new things, but the question is taking this forward probably is going to require a different uh, machinery. Um, I've got about a few minutes before I throw it open to questions, and here I'm going to come back really from the general to bring it back to the particular, and also bring it back to an act of remembering what we have uh, gone through. So if you're comfortable, I would like to ask each one of you, I mean, and going back, I think to the second wave perhaps, what was your most sort of, when did you see that this really is terrible beyond anything that we've ever experienced before? And, and how did you respond to this? Um, can, I, can I start with you, uh, Mr. Randi? So uh, it's probably the first disease that I've seen where at least one member in, in a family has been severely affected. And in an extended family, somebody has lost a loved one. So I don't know if any other disease in the history, apart from the Spanish flu um, that we have read about, we've seen. And uh, while systems were in place uh, just about time, uh, we did realize that our triaging mechanism was not perfect. Uh, so we, we also did realize, unfortunately, that for those who were mildly affected, some of the beds were occupied, and someone who really needed a bed ended up not finding. So that, that is a flaw in our system. We, we could not set that right probably in time. That, that kind of depressed me. Uh, while we did uh, engage uh, with the community at large, and that was one of the positives, that we had a huge, huge, huge community support, as Prashant was mentioning. Uh, for the first time, uh, we had ownership of ward-wise uh, allocation of the beds, and you had right from a BBMP corporator to uh, panchayat leaders, all of them in, involved right, uh, right from the uh, uh, right from the word go, because everybody did realize this. This is that kind of a disease which required a response right from the ground level up to the uh, highest public administrator, which was the chief minister, and at the national level, the prime minister. So uh, while challenges were there, um, I, I, I think the lessons that we learned, uh, in fact, this is not the first such um, interaction that I am involved in post-COVID. Uh, in fact, the government did organize one on its own uh, under our able leadership of the earlier Chief Secretary, Mr. Vijay Bhaskar. 
uh, we did have a brainstorming in terms of how better prepared we will be. Uh, we did realize that many of our existing systems were broken and, and we needed to have, have had that in place, uh, be it probably a medical helpline, even today, uh, in case somebody needs to find out, as he was telling, how many ICU beds are available. Mm -hmm. I don't have a perfect system in place to tell that go to X hospital, you will get a bed at this moment. So some of these real-time systems, some of these uh, uh, call centers where people could call a helpline, get some advice, have the expert advice of somebody like Dr. Rajni, that, that is probably still not entirely in place. And, and it is what we... Uh, if, if you really ask me that what we need to do is we need to get our basic systems in place. People need to have that accessibility, um, transparency and at the end of the day we are answerable to somebody who is diseased and who requires medical attention. I mean we cannot shy away uh, from that, be it the public sector or the private. Uh, we have a very strong regulation in Karnataka to manage the private hospitals which is the KPME, Karnataka Private Medical Establishments Act. So. It needs to be a carrot and stick policy and we need to get them all on board so that really health becomes, uh, I mean, an equitable kind of a subject which everybody can, has access to. Thank you. Prashant, can I move to you? Maybe three very quick uh, reflections. I remember the second wave um, because very well uh, what happened is the previous night there were these deaths which was widely reported that in Chamrajnagar District Hospital possibly not all related to the lack of oxygen, but there were several deaths on one day, um, uh, the oxygen-related uh, deaths. Um, and the next day, the uh, CEO of uh, ZP, who is a uh, uh, young IAS officer, uh, he called and said, I heard you guys are doing some public health work and we need to set up a triad system now. Can you come and help? And so me and my wife, both of us are doctors, that day we, we left and the next nearly a month was spent in the uh, district headquarters where we worked so closely with the medical college and the DHO and we became part of that team. So there were about four or five of us and we, I think the district responded amazingly. What led to the crisis, unfortunately, I don't think we talk enough about it. I wish we talk more about the things we didn't do and I'm really glad uh, that, uh, uh, that the commissioner acknowledges this because it's sometimes it's very important to say we failed mm. because otherwise uh, we will not we, we don't call something a problem we will not solve it so that's that's one thing I will remember uh, because the, the district really came together uh, after that uh, terrible uh, crisis the second thing I think I'll remember is this song Corona Mari even today if anyone in the audience travels to BR Hills and you stay in any of the several uh, resorts lodges there do meet Basavaraju. He performs. He per Basavaraju performs and he still performs every single time to tourists the Corona Mari Nritya and he tells them that we took this Nritya Noora Nalwatta into Podaglalli Aur Maani For 148 uh, tribal villages, some of them completely roadless, he has gone and performed and changed mindsets. So that remains. That's, uh, that also tells me how COVID is not also all about darkness. We can, we can celebrate it in a folk art. We can celebrate it through various uh, ways in which you know, it will continue to be uh, uh, remembered. Um, I forgot the third part, but third thing that I had, but these two uh, things I will share. Thank you very much. Maybe we should have a cadre of cultural performers <laughs> who, who, <laughs> sort of, who seem to be very effective. <laughs> Just th that we don't say this is only a tribal thing. Yeah. We had a difficulty uh -huh. in convincing many, many yeah. e even in the urban pockets mm -hmm. about vaccination, mm -hmm. uh, be, be it a particular community or... Uh, so it took a lot of effort. It was mm -hmm. not that easy initially. Mm -hmm. But then when people actually started seeing people dying and, and, and then the demand for vaccination really shot up. So, uh, it, so you just cannot expect a tribal citizen to immediately take it up. That's so the true. challenge is much more there. Yeah. Yeah. I was in the headquarters mm. in Geneva and it was very difficult to see what was happening here. It was very, very painful. And uh, so I was, of course, doing things at multiple levels, but I wanted to do something, uh, you know, to help people manage patients here. So what we did is friends of ours uh, run the Echo platform. I'm sure that you're also all familiar with. Yeah, so... So what, and there were several Indian doctors in the US and Canada who said, what can we do, what can we do? We're not able to go to India, but, so we said, okay, let's use the Echo platform. 
to train uh, and, and to build because a lot of doctors and nurses didn't know how to use all these different oxygen devices all of a sudden, you know. There were so many devices being donated and imported and flown in. So a few states uh, said, their uh, health secretary said they would like to do it. And so we set up these things and I attended few of those sessions with Nepal also. So we had with Nepal because they also faced a very bad Delta wave and with several states in India where the experts from US and Canada would be on the call and there would be like 700 doctors and nurses on that, on that evening discussion and for, it'll go for about two hours, case based. And so through that, it went on for about four to six weeks. I think they all became very uh, uh, familiar with how to manage sick patients, what to do and what not to do. So that was in a way what I could do specifically to help uh, the situation in India. But it was also the time that uh, uh, that COVAX was trying to roll out vaccines around the world and our supplies had dried up because all countries had diverted supplies to their own citizens and there was huge hope that Serum Institute of India would be the main supplier of COVAX and of course those doses were needed in India. So that dried up. And so we were in a very desperate situation where we had no vaccines and African heads of states used to call us every day saying when can we expect and we had no answer for them actually. It was a terrible situation to be in. And they kept saying, well, how can you sit there and watch this, you know, happening like this? And uh, there was nothing we could do. Because every country, of course, decided that their citizens uh, had to be protected first. The third thing was, I think, the fighting misinformation. Mm -hmm. And uh, especially at that time when people were desperate, you mentioned remdesivir. Of course, a lot of the evidence was on drugs was emerging, but we already knew what didn't work. There were several drugs which we knew in the beginning, hydroxychloroquine and all that. Mm -hmm. By that time, there was very good evidence that ivermectin, hydroxychloroquine, these things did not work, that it was oxygen and steroids for those admitted. Um, remdesivir was, WHO was saying it's okay if you don't have remdesivir, but nobody was really listening to all that. Mm -hmm. And people were doing whatever they want. And as I said, I've seen prescriptions with 25 drugs, you know, and five antibiotics and things like that. And it was like, why, why? I mean, there's a, we're in a country with limited resources. Mm -hmm. Why are we throwing things at patients which are not necessary? It was desperation, of course. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think doctors just wanted to do everything to mm -hmm. save patients, but that did result, firstly, in the black fungus mm -hmm. thing, which only happened in India, by the way. Mm -hmm. Didn't happen anywhere else. It was probably a lot of self-prescription as well of, of uh, steroids. And, uh, um, of course, people have heard, you know, they took loans, they sold their property, etc., to buy remdesivir because that was all selling in the black market. So that was very painful and sad to watch. And the fact that we were not able to control this, that private hospitals were charging whatever they felt like. They were putting whatever drugs they wanted to use. You know, there was no um, adherence to, to the standards and the guidelines which the ministry had, had developed. And then the misinformation on social media, both about vaccines, but also about a lot of other things, the personal attacks that were happening on scientists. Uh, so many public health friends of mine around the world, you know, resigned ultimately because they just couldn't keep up with, uh, with the kind of abuse that mm -hmm. they were facing. That was very uh, painful also and very shocking for me that such a thing could happen, that attacks mm -hmm. on doctors, scientists, public health people could take you know such an ugly mm. turn so I think that's again something to be prepared for because mm. social media is here to stay mm. we can use it for good but it can also suddenly turn into something where a lot of uh, rumors and misinformation is spreading how is the health department going to tackle that we need a team which looks at communication which also includes behavioral and social scientists who are responding and I think the example of this folk music and things like that, which connect with people, is much more effective than, um, yeah, I think any number of advisories that we may get, give. Mm -hmm. It was also the first pandemic in during the age of social media, so it was a completely new, uh, new experience. Though I must say, a, I'm, I'm, a lot of good science was also. Hap not happening, but being reported on Twitter because everybody, yes. the virologists, they were all forming their own groups. There was also a lot of excellent information uh, coming. Um, but I think the misinformation drowned out a lot of that. Um, Dr. Rajni, can I turn to you in terms of 
reflections sort of key about the yeah, second wave. reflections, way. key moments. <laughs> it's, it's, I think that was an, uh, there, there are parts of the second wave that I hope I can erase from my memory someday. Um, and there are parts that will stay with me forever. So it's very Dickensian, but in the opposite way. It was the worst of times. It was the best of times in some ways. Um, it was the worst of times because the number of times that one felt helpless uh, through the entire, like, it was, it was just relentless to not be able to do enough. That was, that was quite a, uh, an overwhelming feeling. But... Uh, what was also extremely heartening was to see communities come together, to see volunteer groups come together, to see non-profit agencies come together. So there was that as well. Um, you know, we spoke about social media. We saw, well, pulmonologists across the world getting onto common platforms, sharing what was working, what was not working. So I think physicians and Definitely pulmonologists across the world are far more connected than they've ever been. And this competitiveness or whatever that exists in academia switched very immediately to knowledge sharing and wanting to help each other. And I think that camaraderie, that knowledge sharing is here to stay. The same is something that I witnessed within the uh, nonprofit or community-based organizations working uh, deeply uh, within communities in India. And I think from that crisis of the second wave, a group of us came together uh, responding to the needs of some of the community-based organizations to make simplified uh, guidelines. Because government and scientific guidelines are very complicated sometimes for an ASHA worker whose level of education may not be enough to read through 30 pages. And how could we simplify that? Dr. Swaminathan mentioned something very important about it's not just important to tell someone what to do, but what not to do. And I think that had a lot to do with the black fungus uh, that we noticed in India, because there were many people who were doing things that they should not have done. Antimicrobial resistance is going to be the next big problem for us to face. There were lessons from this for us. On a very personal note, as um, has been mentioned, everyone lost a family member. I'm going to share a very quick story, and this is the helplessness of not being able to find that bed for a dear uncle of mine whom I've taken care of for a very long time, elderly, one dose of the vaccine received, ended up with COVID. The COVID was not severe, but suffered from a heart attack and renal failure after that as a consequence of the COVID in the second week. No beds available, worsening, finally got a bed three days later, admitted. Um, and this is a problem that we faced in many hospitals, that there weren't enough senior doctors or not those who would go in and examine patients with complicated conditions. And I must uh, applaud the young medical graduates who'd been pulled back from there, who've graduated from postgraduate degrees and just been pulled back into service, the nurses who were there to take care of them. My uncle would say on every video call that I would get him out of that hospital. Wasn't meant to be. He was in an ICU, young doctor, and I tell him that, look, my uncle does not want to be ventilated. He does not want to be intubated and ventilated. So I just want you to make sure that he's comfortable when the end comes. And this young gentleman tells me, ma'am, you're a critical care physician. You should know euthanasia is not legal in India. And I held back that rise of emotion which came in me. And I said, well, this is the best he knows right now. I said, maybe that's what you believe. Let me share a few papers with you. Send me your email ID. I'll share papers with you. I shared position statements. I shared work from the Pali COVID Kerala Alliance, which we had been using Project Echo to share with a simple al you know, flowchart algorithm to follow. The young man calls me back and says, I wish I knew this a month ago. I could have helped more people. Mm -hmm. But he made sure my uncle was not alone when he passed. Mm -hmm. He and the nurse made sure that he received comfort at the end of his life. So these are the stories and the scars that all of us will carry, each family will, but there is something that comes out of it which is learning, mm -hmm. which will carry on for other patients and I hope for our communities as well. Thank you so much for that. Thank you all of you for these. These are really the stories from the front line and, and I think you said, you said this really was 
both the best of times and the worst of times, because it also brought out the best in, in many, many people, and it's wonderful. So um, I'd like to throw the floor open to questions. Yeah, I'm Venkat uh, from Corona Trust. Uh, I would like to uh, talk about long COVID and, uh, and also TB. So these are the two diseases actually affects the lung. And uh, we don't have the mechanism to monitor the lung health. So what we can do to the, the take care of the lungs, which are affected with COVID and which are affected with TB. So as uh, we are developing uh, SOPs for lung clinics, so can we talk about uh, taking care of lung health in the primary health centers? Pulmonologist, I think. Yeah, yeah. Sure. Um, so I think they're two very uh, different uh, topics actually. So long COVID goes beyond the lungs. There's part of it which causes scarring or fibrosis of the lungs and reduced lung function. But long COVID also includes symptoms which affect the heart in terms of rapid changes in heart rate or blood pressure that they face or um, mental health issues like anxiety and depression which have uh, been seen in patients with long COVID. And Part of it is inexplicable fatigue, um, supposed to be similar to what we call chronic fatigue syndrome or myalgic encephalitis, a, a post-viral immune reaction. So the first part, I think, is to just data which we need to collect at all levels of any patient who's had COVID in the past, are they reporting symptoms which are persisting longer than, say, three months or six months? Uh, when we look at lung health, spirometry or the basic tools for measuring lung function are still not available at all primary health centers. That has been a huge um, a drawback for us as pulmonologists and public health physicians to even measure the current status of lung health in India. When we look at global burden of diseases, India is home to one-sixth of the world's population, but we are home to one-third of the chronic respiratory disease burden in the world. So we have double the amount of lung disease that the rest of the world has. So I think a lot of this will really be... Uh, the, the awareness about pulmonology as a specialty rose because of COVID earlier. Most people didn't know the word pulmonology. Uh, so I'm hoping that this will mean that we start measuring lung health more. Uh, Immediate focus overall, what can we do is address air quality. Um, there's so much about lung health which is beyond uh, tuberculosis. Tuberculosis remains the, the biggest killer in India. We still lose at least a thousand people a day to tuberculosis in India. Um, but air quality in cities and biomass fuel exposure for, especially for women in villages. So looking for clean energy solutions and clean air in cities. Uh, at the PHC level, just making sure that screening for lung health is done more and vaccination, those would be the two things that I would want to strengthen maximally. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, my, my question was to Dr. Swami Swaminathan because I have read her CV and you are a specialist in tuberculosis. And I'm coming from the opposite side of the spectrum. And uh, 1955 was when BCG vaccination was introduced in India for the first time. And we are still struggling with uh, multi-drug resistant tuberculosis. So it was very well known that uh, vaccines don't work in uh, respiratory illnesses. So what was the thought process going on when you were at the helm of affairs in WHO? Because there were 13 to 14 different vaccines going around and uh, multiple variants. And I'm sure that all the people in the audience, including the panelists, will not disagree to the fact that the second wave happened after the vaccination program started. As there's no denial of that fact, I'm sure of that. So please, uh, can you just open your minds regarding, because I want to know, see there were 20 crore doses you know, the, uh, of vaccines, spike proteins, 
that were injected into people into their, directly into their bloodstream. How do you standardize 20 crore doses? So, uh, you know, uh, please uh, throw your light on that. Thank you. So I'll it's do a quick, uh, yeah, answer. it's actually, it will take some time to explain, but yeah. uh, very quickly. Firstly, um, yeah, you started by saying tuberculosis, we don't have a good vaccine. I agree with you that BCG is definitely, we need a better vaccine. And I think there's one thing COVID has done is it, it uh, really spurred the whole science of vaccine development, vaccinology. There are a lot of new platforms. So there are people working on TB vaccines. We need to have more TB vaccine candidates coming into clinical trials and so on. So I think I make a good point that uh, India should be investing much more in TB vaccine development because the burden of uh, TB is in uh, India. Um, on how were these other vaccines developed so quickly and so on, I think uh, it's, it's uh, maybe natural to be skeptical about this, but there were many reasons how it happened and why it happened so quickly. Of course, it was unprecedented. Um, We've never had vaccine development in less than one year, but it was firstly because of the investments that had already been made into the science for many, many decades. The mRNA platform was not developed overnight. It, the work started in 1991. And so mRNA vaccines had been tried for chikungunya, this and that, some phase one trials were going on. And a few companies which had the technology said, why don't we try it for this? And perhaps it was luck that they proved to be so highly effective and safe. Um, so that was one investment in science. The second is that there was a huge global effort coordinated by the WHO to develop uh, benchmarks were set, regulatory agencies came on board, ben everybody agreed on you know, what the standards would be. Um, high income countries poured billions of dollars, it's estimated about $100 billion of investment went into COVID vaccine alone. So a huge amount of money went into vaccine development and uh, which includes you know, rolling out clinical trials very quickly. But what was not compromised was the scientific standards. So neither safety nor efficacy standards were lowered. That was very clear right from the beginning. And so you talked about the second wave in India at that time, very few people had had the vaccine. As you remember, it started in January, gradually first uh, healthcare workers, frontline workers, elderly, slowly uh, coming up. So I think just eight to 10% of the population had received, and many of them had one dose, had not received the second dose. And that is why I think that wave hit. After that, it picked up. So by the end of 21, we saw very high coverage in India, but certainly in March, April, May, the coverage was, was very low. So it was not that vaccines did not work, it was people had not received uh, their vaccines. Uh, and most parts of the world, except in very high income countries where they had started rolling out very early. People had not received their vaccines when the Delta wave actually. So it was not just India, it was you saw the whole of Latin America was devastated by, by uh, Delta. So I think vaccine development has, uh, has been boosted by this, uh, by this experience. What is still, I think, a challenge for us is to explain this vaccine development to people and the steps and how does it proceed and how come it happened so quickly can it happen like this for other diseases also? Yes, I think we should speed up vaccine development when we need it for other diseases as well. But again, I think communication around uh, the safety, how is it being monitored, what action is being taken, you know, I think there again, much more proactive communication uh, because, you know, there's always one side effect out of a million, right? And all these vaccines cannot be 100%. They can be 99.99% safe. So out of a million doses, you may have a couple of people who develop severe side effects which need to be managed. Deaths were very rare, but severe side effects, yes, were reported. And therefore, that data needs to be put into perspective. And so when we talked about misinformation on social media, what some groups were specializing in doing is taking some data from something, but then twisting it in a way that made it look like there were terrible things happening with vaccines um, without the benefits. So when, you, when it comes to a medical intervention, it's about benefits versus risks. It's always, uh, you have to make a, a decision based on benefit versus risks. And that is how the, the vaccines were rolled out. Not all vaccines were approved, by the way. There were many vaccines that did not meet the standards of either efficacy or uh, safety. So they were not approved. So I think the system worked overall.
<laughs> Thank you so much for sharing your experiences. They've been very um, valuable, and I'm so glad we could record some of this. I mean, record, not physically record, but at least hear you talking about these uh, experiences. So thank you so much for your time, and thank you to the audience for coming here, and thank you very much, BIC, for putting this together.